All right. Well, we're doing it online today. Yes. As I see the icicles hanging off the trees out there, I can see that probably this was a good idea. Um, yesterday was very bizarre. Um, what was that supposed to be? The rain was so hard. I mean, it was tough. It was tough. But um, anyway, so today what we're going to do is start chapter eight. Now, um, we're done reviewing and we've already chosen a date of 317 to have the first midterm, which we've already discussed. And so that will be on chapters five and six only. All the reviewing is done. All the answers have been posted on Moodle, so you can go look at them anytime. So now we're gonna start looking at eight. Um, and by the way, uh, eight is the entire second midterm. In other words, the second midterm is entirely based on this chapter. So it won't be really too much further along that we'll be getting ready for midterm number two. But right now we just wanna focus on the new material and uh, you'll see that it's pretty different than what we've been doing. There's still a lot of algebra, but at least now it's all designed for a specific application where we're gonna be learning about how interest rates are calculated and how you can answer questions like, um, what if, if I put money in the bank, how much will I have in the future? Um, you know, that type of thing. Or maybe if I borrow money, how much will my monthly payments be? So this is a very important area for, you know, practical applications, but it also ties in directly with what we've been doing. So um, there's a handful of new formulas we have to learn. And of course we'll need the calculators. Um, so in fact, these some of these calculations will be on the challenging side, but that's all right, we'll get it done. Um, it's really not that much more complicated than what we've been doing. It's just, it's a different application more than anything else. So as you can see, the title of the chapter is Consumer Math, which really specifically refers to um, calculating interest rates and determining how much a sum of money will be worth in the future. Now, of course, you could spend an entire semester on consumer math, and some schools actually do offer an entire course called usually something like personal finance, where this is all they do the whole time. <clears throat> so um, we're just touching on this topic, basically. We're looking at some um, important concepts, but there's still a lot more that comes after this. But at least you'll get a feel for what we're trying to accomplish here. And it'll give you a better sense of, um, you know, like if you go to borrow money or if you decide to save money, how the interest rates you're paying or receiving are being calculated. So anyway, we're going to start out by looking at something called simple interest. So you're probably already aware, even if you don't have any bank accounts and if you've never borrowed money, interest is charged when you borrow money, but you also receive interest when you save money. Okay, so if you put money in the bank, um, maybe in a savings account or a checking account, they typically will offer you some interest, although it's not very much, to reward you for leaving your money with the bank. Um, now, of course, the bank isn't doing this just to be nice. What they are doing is taking all the savings of individuals and bundling them together into loans, which they then turn around and lend to people who want to, let's say, borrow, uh, buy a car, or people who want to buy a house. Um, in order to do this, they have to put together all these small savings accounts to create the money they need to lend it out to another customer. So this is where their uh, profits come from. They'll let's say pay you 1% on your savings account, and then they'll charge somebody 8% for a car loan. The difference between those two is where their profits are coming from. Now, it sounds like a lot, but the reality is that when they lend money to customers, they're taking on a lot of risk. Um, the biggest risk they have to worry about, of course, is that they will not get the money back. <laughs> In other words, when you lend money out, you're hoping that you get it back with interest. Um, it doesn't always work out that way. So that's why the banks have to charge more interest to lend it out than they can pay you on your savings deposits or your checking account. So simple interest, oh, by the way, we have to introduce a handful of key concepts before we do anything else. Uh, what we're gonna do is introduce some new variables that we haven't used before. So we'll start out with the letter P, which will represent the word principal. And in this context, the word principal means the amount of money that you have either borrowed or lent. Okay, so if you put $1,000 in the bank, we call that principal. 
if you um, borrow $10,000 to buy a used car, we also call that principal. So the principal is the amount of money that's either been borrowed or lent. <clears throat> now we'll use the lo lowercase r to represent the interest rate. <clears throat> and this is always expressed as a percentage. So right now at this point in time, interest rates are at unusually low levels by historical standards. Um, so if you put your money in the bank, you're gonna get a very low rate of interest. But the good thing about that is that the cost of borrowing is also lower than it normally is. So um, for example, if you went out to buy a house, the interest rate that you might be able to pay could be as little as let's say 4%, whereas in normal times, it could be as high as six, seven, eight, nine percent So, you know, this, the economy goes through cycles and in some periods we have very low rates. There are other periods in time where rates are very high. It just so happens that right now uh, rates are very low, although they'll probably start going back up again this year. And so if you went to a bank, for example, and you wanted to know how much would it cost me to you know, borrow money for a car, they would tell, give you an interest rate. Um, let's say, for example, 0.06 or 6%. And that means that the interest is 6% of the principal that you borrowed, okay? So um, it's always expressed as a percentage and it's also expressed as a percentage per year. That's an important detail because you don't just pay 6% once, you're paying 6% for as long as the loan is outstanding. Every year that goes by, you pay more and more interest <clears throat> until the loan is paid off. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why people get into trouble with credit cards, because not only is the interest rate very high, but it continues to pile up as long as you don't pay off your balances. So um, interest, uh, credit cards are very a little different because unlike with a car loan, if a bank gives you a credit card, you can buy whatever you want with that money. Um, with a car loan, at least you have to buy a car. And the good thing from the bank's perspective is that if, if you buy a car with, a, with borrowed money and you don't make the car payments, the bank can actually come and take the car back and they can sell it. So that helps reduce their risk. If, you, if they lend you money to buy a house, it's the same thing. If you don't make the payments, they can eventually take the house back and sell it. But with a credit card, um, there's nothing to take back. If you, let's say, use your credit card to go on a very expensive vacation. And then when you get back, you realize you can't pay that money back. Um, there's nothing for the bank to take back. So they charge you typically a very high rate of interest on your credit cards because it's very risky from their perspective. So you can tell, if you look at the rates that they charge, um, you know, the lower the rate is, that means the safer it is from the bank's perspective. <clears throat> All right, anyway, now T, time. Well, typically the thing of T is the passage of time, but we'll measure it in terms of years normally, okay? Because usually when you borrow money, it's not um, the case that you're gonna pay it back right away. Um, for example, with a car loan, it might be five or six years before you've paid the loan off. So, uh, and then with a house, it could be go out 30 years. So therefore, um, time is important. It matters a great deal for how long you're borrowing this money. Now, A, now the book uses A for this. I don't know why, but it it's, represents something called future value. So the, the simplest way to think about this is if I put money in the bank now, and leave it there, let's say for a year, how much will it be worth at the end of the year? Okay, so imagine, for example, if I start today by putting $1,000 in the bank and I don't touch it and the bank pays me interest, my question is how much will it be worth? next year, it'll be $1,000 plus however much interest I've earned. Okay, so we don't know how much that is just yet because we don't know what the interest rate is, but it'll be $1,000, which is the principal, plus some interest. Okay, principal and interest. So the sum of these two, and let's just say that it's a, it turns out to be a thousand. Let's just keep it simple. Let's say it turns out to be a thousand and fifty dollars. Well, then it should be pretty clear that fifty dollars of that is interest. The rest is my principal. 
That was my money that I put in the bank. So we would say that the future value in this case, A would be 1,050. In other words, how much will I have in the future after depositing this principal in the bank and earning interest? All right, so they call it A. I mean, they could have called it F, I suppose, but we know what it means. It's just how much will that be worth in the future? And that's an important question, um, especially like you know, down the road when you're working and earning a lot of money, you might find yourself saving for your retirement. And even though it might be 50 years before you retire, um, you still have to know how much money is piling up in your bank account <clears throat> in order to plan properly. Or how about this scenario? Suppose you've decided to save up so you can make a down payment on a new car when you graduate. You've decided that you deserve a car. And uh, you know when you graduate and you start working, um, you'll establish a credit record that will enable you to go to the bank and um, borrow money for a car. But they're gonna ask you for a down payment. They won't typically lend you the entire amount because it's, you know, it's kind of a lot of money. A new car typically costs anywhere from $25,000 and up. So routinely, they might ask you for at least $1,000 down payment. And they do that to reduce the risk that you don't pay the money back. So you have to have that money. Otherwise, you won't get your car, even if you're borrowing the rest of it. So you may want to start saving now to have that down payment. And so it's important to know if you put X dollars in the bank now, how much will it be worth in the future? That's what this is all about. Now. Here's another, remember before we said that lowercase r is the interest rate. That's a percentage. We're also gonna define i to be the dollar value of your interest, okay? So we have to make a distinction here between dollars and percentages, okay? So lowercase r is a percentage. <clears throat> this is a dollar amount. So in this example up here on top, um, $50 would be my interest because that's how much I end up with at the end. I get my principal back plus the additional $50. That was the interest that the bank paid me. All right, now here's a simple formula. Now, simple interest, by the way, the reason why it's called that is because simple interest what makes it simple. It's not just because the formula is so simple. That's not really the reason. Simple interest is calculated based on the principal only. Now, when I say it that way, you're probably wondering, well, what else could it be? Well, it turns out that for a long-term loan, like a car loan, what starts to happen is that as the loan continues, um, you the interest accumulates. And so what starts happening is that the interest itself can be based on not only the principal that you borrowed, but the amount of interest that you've accumulated on the loan. So um, we'll see how that works later on. But right now, we'll just note that simple interest is exclusively calculated on the principal amount that was either borrowed or lent. And you can see it's a very simple idea. All we need to know is what was the principal what was the rate of interest that they paid us and how much time in years did we leave the money in the bank if we're depositing it? If we're borrowing, then it just becomes how many uh, years before we paid the money back. And that's it, that's all there is to it. Wow, that's simple. <laughs> it doesn't get any simpler than that. So let's look at a quick example of that. Oh, you know what I forgot to mention, by the way, um, because we're recording this, or well, maybe I didn't mention that, this is being recorded. So uh, I will, when we're done, I will be posting this on YouTube under my account where I have all my academic recordings there. And you'll be able to watch this again if you need to for some reason, okay? So I just wanna put that out there. Um, if you miss something, if you're not sure, you can go back and watch the recording. This is one of the few good things that came about from the COVID, um, the ability to record these things. But anyway, suppose that an investor deposits $1,000 for one year in a bank account where the interest rate is 3%. How much simple interest will the investor have by the end of the year? 
Well, so we look at our simple formula and we can see that we just take our thousand dollars, we multiply it by 3% for one year and we end up with $30. And that's all there is to it. Now, if, the, if they had left the money there for two years, we only need to make one change. Um, that would be the T. And that means it's $60 after two years. So this concept is very straightforward. Okay. Beautiful. Now, that raises the question, how much will we have in the bank at the end of that first year? Well, I think it should be pretty clear that Let's go back to this first example where we only left the money there for one year. At the end of the year, our balance would be, of course, the original principal plus 30 more dollars. So this is what we called A earlier. This is the future value. How much will it be in the future? When the year's over, we'll have $1,030. Now, if you notice, the $1,000 here is P, uh, running out of space here. What I'm trying to show you here is that A is really nothing but P plus I. My principal plus my interest, my simple interest, that is. Okay, that's it. When I add those together, I have my future value. So what we can do then is, uh, actually we can write this in two equivalent ways, depending on which is more convenient. <clears throat> we can calculate the future value based on simple interest as not only P plus I, but if you recall, we already saw earlier that I equals PRT. And that means I can factor out a P. And so I can rewrite this as A equals P times one plus RT. They both mean the same thing because of the way I is defined. All right, so either way, you've got the same result. All right, so using the example we just had, we'll show you uh, how to calculate A in both ways. Uh, first, we'll just add them together, the P and the I. So remember, we saw already that P is 1,000, the interest is 30. So if you just add them up, you'll have $1,030 in your account. That we knew, okay, that was the easy one. What about the equivalent approach? Would that work the same way? Let's see. Ah, here's the alternative version. Now you see what's happening here is we're taking the P and multiplying it by one plus R where the R itself is also being multiplied by T. So what this means is that I'm just taking 1,000 times 1.03, where 1.03 is one plus the interest that I'm earning for that year. And then that gives me my A, 1030. So as you can see, it's the same either way. Very good. Now, what if I left the money there for less than a year? What would be different? Well, remember, T is measured in years. So if I'm leaving the money for less than a year in the bank, T becomes a fraction. Okay, so it's, it's not that uh, involved. Uh, for example, uh, what if I put 
$1,000 in the bank for only six months. Well, let's see, how about here? $1,000 goes into the bank for six months where the bank pays an annual rate of 4%. By the way, whenever you see an interest rate, it's understood that it means so much per year. You, they don't have to tell you, it means per year. Here we're, we're only leaving the money there for six months, which will treat it as one half of a year. So if you notice here, I've got P, 1,000, the rate is 4% per year, <clears throat> but I only left the money there for six months, so I have to change this T to one half. So after six months, my interest is only $20. It would have been 40 for the whole year, but I only left it there for six months. Okay, so I can easily calculate any amount I need just by adjusting T. Okay, if it had been two years, I would have replaced the two with the, uh, the T with the two, and I would have ended up with $80. Okay, so it's really that straightforward. So, so far, this isn't too painful, is it? But, well, it'll get co more complicated as we go along, but it's a good start, all right? And the next time you actually wander into a bank, <laughs> in this day and age, there's almost no reason for anyone to actually go inside there, is there? Um, almost everybody is showing up just to use the ATM. And even then, not, not so much, you know, in this day and age, if you, for some reason, are paid with a physical check, um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but at least with Chase, there's an app that lets you take a picture of the check and you can then deposit it directly in your account without ever going to the bank. It's pretty cool. I'm sure you, you've all seen it. Um, and I'm sure all the other banks have it too because the check itself is covered with all these little codes, which we have no idea what they mean, but it means something to the bank. <laughs> and so the picture is clear enough that it can be read into your phone and then transmitted to the bank. And the bank says, okay, that's now in your account. And then the physical check itself is no longer valid. Okay, and then they ask you to write on the check, um, you know, the fact that you're depositing it in your bank account. So um, the technology is really, really advancing like crazy. And what if you just want to move your money from a savings to a checking account or vice versa? Just get online um, and do it right then and there. There's hardly ever any reason anymore to physically go in the bank. But if you want to discuss something like borrowing money for a house, then you really do kind of need to go inside and talk to them. <laughs> um, and when you do, you'll see that they have signs all over the place showing you what kind of interest they're paying on their different accounts. Now, you may have noticed too that some supermarkets actually have a small bank. Um, and if they do, you can go over there and look at the signs and you'll find out what kind of interest rates they're offering and how much they're all also charging for loans. Um, just out of interest, curiosity, you're, you don't have to borrow money just because you walked into the bank. Um, but yeah, it's getting to that point where, you know, we hardly ever go inside anymore. But um, if you do, you can get all this information very quickly and easily. Now, most major banks will have a website anyway. So if you really need to know how much your bank is charging for car loans, you should be able to find it on the internet anyway. But when it comes time to actually taking care of it, you probably won't need to do it in person. Okay, well, anyway. Um, now, here's the thing about this formula. The beauty of this formula this I equals PRT, it's a lot more flexible than you might realize because I can rearrange this now algebraically and solve for any one of these four variables, okay? It's not just for I. For example, what if I need to figure out the principal? So if you start out with I equals PRT, I can easily solve for P by dividing both sides by RT. Oh yeah, look at that. So if I need to know P, then I can solve for it as I over RT. Now that's kind of helpful. Uh, you might, for example, want to know um, how much do I need to borrow to reach a certain target? Uh, how much do I need to pay for that down, down payment on my car, for example? So let's look at a quick example of this. And you don't have to memorize this either. Remember, this is your starting point. Once you have that straight, I can solve for I, I can solve for P, R, or T. 
that's a nice little formula there. <laughs> All right, so how about this case? A homeowner has borrowed from a bank to finance various repairs. The simple interest paid in a loan is $20,000. Let's make a note of that. The rate is 4% per year. And the principal will be repaid in five years, meaning this is a five-year loan. How much money did the homeowner borrow? Oh, so we're trying to solve for P because that is the principal. So we're gonna plug these numbers in. Now, by the way, when you do this on your calculator, you must use parentheses in the denominator. All right, so in other words, you're gonna say 20,000 divided by open parentheses 0.04 times five parentheses equals. <clears throat> if you forget about the parentheses, it will, it will give you the wrong answer. It'll be something way off too, most likely. It'll be not even close to the correct value. So when you plug in those numbers, you should get 100,000. Okay, now it, it, in algebra, you can see the parentheses look like this, but on the calculator, <clears throat> this whole expression is what should be contained within the parentheses. Just be aware of that. Okay, sometimes the calculator strokes don't exactly match up with what you're seeing algebraically. Now that was very helpful, okay? Now that's right. Now we can figure out how much money the, the homeowner must have borrowed. Now, how about R? Well, we can solve for P and I, we can also solve for R by rearranging this thing algebraically. It's so simple. Now I'm dividing, basically you're just dividing out what you don't need, okay? So by dividing by PT, I'm canceling out these and I'm left with this expression. So now this is even more interesting potentially because now I can figure out what rate of interest this bank is actually charging. Um, you know, like for example, if you know how much interest you're going to earn, you can back it out of there, how much interest, what the rate must have been. It's like. When you look at your credit card bill and you see how much interest they charged you, um, you might want to say, well, how much interest does that represent anyway? And so you can use a technique like this to do that. It's like, you, I mean, when you look at how much you paid for something in the store, you theoretically could figure out, as we've seen, um, how much sales tax you must have paid and what rate you're being charged. And you're doing something similar here. So imagine this scenario. An investor puts a million dollars into a certificate of deposit for one year, which by the way, a certificate of deposit is a special type of savings account where you have to leave the money there for a specific length of time. Okay, in this case, it's a year. You can't have it back before the year is over, but in exchange for that, the bank gives you more interest than they would with a regular savings account. So if you have money that you're sure you won't need for a year, you can put it in one of these and earn a little extra interest. Now, <clears throat> in practice, there are certain things that like certain types of emergencies that they would give you your money back. Like for example, if you, uh, I don't know, if your house burns down or something, or if you're in the hospital, you know, but it has to be a real emergency. Anything short of that, you're committed to leaving the money there for a full year. Um, and by the way, even if they do give it back to you early, they're gonna hit you with so many penalties that you will probably be better off not doing this at all. But for people who have a lot of money set aside who can save it for long periods of time, this is a good way to earn more interest. And again, if you go to the bank, you'll see the signs all over the place that tell you what kind of interest they're paying on these different CDs. They go out, as far as I know, to about 10 years. But anyway, if, if this investor is going to earn $20,000 during the year, what rate of interest is the bank paying him? Well, that's why we have this R formula. Look how easy that is. 
Okay, if you plug in those numbers, you'll discover that this bank is paying 2%. 0.02, of course, is 2%. Now, you know what? This calculator probably has a special button. I'm going to check this out. Um, there's a, you never know what's going to be in this calculator. It's a very surprisingly sophisticated calculator, considering that it's free. Um, it may be possible for it to do the conversion for you when it comes to percentages. Um, oh, maybe not. No, oh, hold on a second. All right. No, it works only one direction apparently. If I type in two, if you look directly above the uh, nine, you'll see that percentage button. If I hit nine and I hit that percentage button, it converts it into 0.09. So it'll take the percentage and turn it into a decimal, but it doesn't apparently go the other way. But, oh, no, it doesn't, no. Oh, well, <laughs> that's right. I think we understand how this works. So 2% is just an alternative way of expressing 0.02. Oh, sorry, somebody has a chat here. I didn't see that, sorry. Good morning, Faye. Um, I just, oh, did you just type that? Good, because I just noticed it. Um, you know, in the past, this, this Zoom thing, when somebody put something in the chat room, it used to flash orange for a while. So it was so obvious. Now I have to sort of look at it. So if I don't see your chat right away, it just means that it's not in an obvious place. Oh, it's, it, I'm not ignoring you. I will see it and, and catch up with you eventually. And by the way, since we're online, um, I guess we should mention this. You may, uh, you can type into this chat room questions. Also, all you have to do is unmute yourselves. If you just wanna say, hey, wait a minute, I don't get that, please repeat it. Um, it was just a question of turning off the unmuting here that I see you've all got muted microphones and then you can physically talk and then I'll hear what you're saying. Also, I know it's first thing in the morning. Do you realize that there's a little button here too that you can actually have your camera on so I can actually see you, which I'm not expecting. I'm not requiring it. Uh, it's okay if you don't want me to see. But um, if you do, let's say, um, I don't know, you've got some really cool posters in your room that you want everyone to see. You can turn the thing on and we can all ex experience <laughs> those wonderful posters, okay? So, all right, anyway. So um, where are we? So yes, this was 2%. Now, how about time? You might ask yourself a question like this. How long will it take me to accumulate a certain amount of interest in my account? That's a very valid question. Okay, how would you do that? Okay, a lot of this comes down to planning and thinking. Because, you know, when you're saving your money, this is a, this is a long-term uh, decision. What am I hoping to do with this money? What do I need to buy in the future? Um, you know, obviously you have to pay regular bills, you know, when you graduate and you're working and you're in an apartment or a house, there's certain things that have to be paid all the time, like rent and electricity and gas and, you know, but if you have anything left over, hopefully to save, then you have to start thinking about the long run and think about, well, what will my needs be in the next 10 or 20 years? Should I save money to buy a house? Should I, you know, buy a new car? Should I lease a car? Um, there's a lot of questions involved in just having your own set household. And um, among them would be, how should I save my money? Um, whatever money I've accumulated, um, if I leave it in the bank, you know, it may not earn a whole lot of interest. So maybe there's other things I can do with it. So these types of calculations can help us plan a little bit better um, and hopefully maximize our incomes during our lifetimes. So anyway, we rearrange this algebraically. And again, like I said, if they have a class called personal finance or something along those lines, that's what they will discuss in that class. I don't know if they do or they don't. Um, I think they should if they don't, but not every school offers that. Anyway, so this is how you find time, which is measured in years, right? So now this time an investor puts $100,000 into a CD that pays an annual rate of interest of 3%. During the time frame that the CD will be uh, current, the investor will earn $30,000 in simple interest. 
How long will it be until the CD matures? So this time we're looking for time, all right? So we know that the principal is 100,000. The rate is 3% and time is what we're looking for. Um, but we do also know that I is 30,000. So we go back to our formula and say, oh, that's right. We can rearrange this and solve for T. How convenient. What an amazing formula this is. <laughs> so that's 30,000 divided by 3,000, which is 10, which is, since it's time, that means it's 10 years. So in other words, it'll take 10 years to earn that much simple interest in this case. Okay, so that means this investor put money in a 10-year CD, which means they don't need the money anytime soon, that's for sure. And in exchange for that, they're getting a pretty high rate of interest, 3%, which by today's standards is a very high rate of interest, believe me. Um, so that, that's how we know it'll take 10 years uh, for this to happen. All right, now, as I've mentioned before, all of this is revolving around something called simple interest, interest paid on principal only. The other type of interest that you can either earn or pay is called compound interest. Okay, so compound interest is interest paid on interest. And that seems like a strange idea, but it's absolutely true. Um, if you borrow money, like let's say you have a credit card and you don't pay the balance every month, which most people don't, what will happen is they'll add um, interest here, they'll charge you interest by adding it to the balance that's outstanding. And if you, in the next month, you don't pay it again, the interest you're paying is not just what you charged, but the interest they charged you the previous month that was not paid. So you start getting paid, pay, you start paying interest on the amounts you borrowed or charged, plus the interest that you accumulated in the past that was never paid off. And so that's when, like I said, people start to get into trouble because that can accumulate quite rapidly, maybe more so than most people realize. And so you can find yourself in trouble in a hurry if you're not careful with credit cards. So, <laughs> Yeah, I know it's easy. It feels like, wow, I can just have whatever I want. I'll just whip out the credit card, but um, it, it can be really be a headache. But um, anyway, so with compound interest, um, we know we already have seen that interest can be paid on the principal, which is simple interest, but it can also be paid on the interest, which is known as compound interest. So when you borrow or lend money under most conditions, there ends up typically being some of each, okay? It's very unusual that you only pay simple interest or receive. Most of the time, there's some of both, okay? Now, once we introduce compound interest though, unfortunately, our formulas are starting to get a little messier now. In particular, this one that we already have seen has to be replaced with something more complex. Now, before we do that, I wanna do a little bit of a detour here. Okay, so now here's what we need to go over. Up to this point, to keep things simple, we've been assuming that Interest is paid at the end of each year. Okay. Um, interest can be paid at the end of each year. When this happens, it is said to be compounded annually. But suppose instead, 
that interest is paid twice per year. So you might say, oh, I'd love that because I'll get twice as much interest. No, what it means is that you'll get half the annual rate twice a year. So let me show you an example of that. Uh, actually, let me do this. Um, it's easier to write on this. So we're going to look at um, two scenarios. Suppose a bank pays 4% interest. at the end of each year. Fine. If $1,000 is deposited, it will be worth Uh, 1,000 times one plus 0.04 times one, or 1,040 at the end of the year. All right, that's fine, we get it, that's, we've seen that. But now, what if the bank changes this to paying not 4% at the end of the year, but 2% every six months. Aha, so after six months or half a year, A equals 1,000. And we saw this earlier, by the way, one of the examples showed exactly what happens when we only have six months in our deposit. 4% is suddenly multiplied by a half. So we end up with $1,020 after six months. But what about the next six months? At the end of the year, Oh, one more thing I forgot to mention, these handwritten notes that I'm putting in here, I'm going to save this file with a new name on it. And then the original plus this will be on Moodle. So if you wanna go back and look at these handwritten notes that I'm doing, um, they'll be, you'll look at it, like I've changed the title of this slide to, uh, it's got the name of the, it says 8.30 a.m. and then it says the date. So that way you'll say, oh, here we go. So I wanna go back and revisit this example the original slides don't have all this, as you can see, but this one does. So you'll have a copy of this as well as the uh, recording if you want to go back and review this. But anyway, at the end of the year, A will equal, now watch this. This is where it's interesting. Not 1,000 times 1 plus some rate of interest, 1,020 times 1 plus 0.04 times a half. So if you multiply that out, it's 1020 times 1.02, you might be in for a little bit of a surprise here because you're gonna wind up with $1,040 and 40 cents. Oh, wait a minute, what happened? Up here, I ended up with 1,040. This time, even though it was still 4%, because it was distributed in two equal halves, like this, 2% and 2%, I got more interest. How did that happen? There's an extra 40 cents that I didn't have before. Well, here's why. 
this key to the whole thing is because during the second half of the year, uh, I am earning interest not just on the original principal of $1,000. I'm also earning interest on this $20 that I earned during the first half of the year. That's where the extra 40 cents came from. That's 2% of $20. So all of a sudden I'm earning interest, not just on the original principal, but on the interest that I earned during the second half of the year. And so the grand conclusion to all this is that in the second scenario, the investor earned $40 worth of simple interest and 40 cents worth of compound interest. Okay, in other words, interest on the $20 worth of interest earned during the first six months of the year. Ah, uh, see now that leads us to some interesting conclusions. But hopefully you can see what just happened here. You might, it may not have seemed like it, but instead of waiting to the end of the year to pay 4% by splitting it up 2%, 2%, we ended up earning more money, more interest. And we're happy, aren't we? Yes, we are. That's our money. Even though it's only 40 cents, that's still our money. Um, we would never say to the bank, listen, you don't worry about that. You can keep it. No, that's our money. So that's how compound interest is, arises in these situations. Now I'm gonna mention here a rule, an important rule, and we're gonna see why in a second. as the compounding frequency it's called, or number of times per year that interest is paid increases, the simple interest never changes, but the compound interest increases, which means the total interest increases because your interest consists of simple and compound. Okay, now let's do another. Now this one's gonna take a few minutes. We're gonna go back to this example. And now let's see what happens if interest is paid four times a year. So if interest, is paid four times per year. In other words, one per uh, one percent every three months instead of four percent once per year. So let's check it out. So we start with a thousand times one plus 0.04 times 0.25. So after three months, you'll have $1,010. Okay. What happens after six months? Well, now here's the interesting part. What's changing is right here. This number is no longer a thousand, it's a thousand and ten. Um, so that that is a big deal. And so because of that, at the end of the six months, you're not going to have a thousand and twenty like we did in the last example. You're going to have a thousand and twenty dollars and ten cents. Again, it doesn't seem like a lot, but that is your money. Now, what about nine months? This time we're gonna apply this formula to not 1,010, 
but $1,020.10. All right. So let me just copy this here. After nine months, oops, 1,020.10 is multiplied by this expression and we'll end up with $1,030. And although I should probably round this to dollars and cents, let's leave it like this, okay. And then finally, after a year or 12 months, Uh, this now is 1,030.301, and how much will I have? Ooh, let's find out. $1,040. And 60, let's say 60.4 cents. Now the bank is gonna round that to 60 cents. But remember, when we split it up into two equal payments, of 2% each, we ended up with $1,040.40. So by splitting this up into four equal payments of 1% each, the amount went up, didn't it? Ooh, now this is getting interesting because like I said, the simple interest is still $40. The compound interest is growing, isn't it? That's right. So, and so, by the way, what we just did was called quarterly compounding. So with quarterly compounding, in other words, interest is paid four times per year. We have simple interest is 40. Compound interest is 60. Or the total interest is 40.604. Compared with semi annual, where we only made 40 cents worth of compound interest. Actually, you know what I'm going to do just for completeness sake? I'm going to sneak this back up here. This is so nice. Oh, hold on. Um, just, yeah, I'd like to have the same summary. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to <laughs> make this a little more coherent. All right, so here we go. Now, I guess I probably could have typed this to make it a little neater, but you get the idea. Um, so what I wanted everyone to see is when we change the compound and frequency, what happens to the simple and the compound interest and therefore what happens to the total interest. So when we jumped up to um, semi-annual from annual, um, all of a sudden we have 40 cents worth of compound interest. When we jump ahead to quarterly, that goes up to 60.4. And by the way, um, let me just do one more thing. With annual compounding, which is what we started with, just so it's crystal clear, the simple interest is 40, the compound interest is zero, and the total is still 40. Oh, I typed this wrong, it's compound interest. It's not typically called compounding interest, it's compound interest, sorry about that. There we go. 
Okay. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay, now, what we might as well do here, let me add one more detail here. Um, the future value is there for 1,040. We're just adding the principal. Okay, so what this does is it shows us now, let's say I raise it to 12 times a year. Now, I don't know if I want to, let me add one more thing here. Okay, I don't know if I wanna do this 12 times though. I mean, it was fine with semi-annual and with quarterly um, to go through and see how this works and that's fine. But at some point you have to ask yourself, you know, is it worth all the extra time to do this? It would be wonderful if there was a formula that I could use to do this directly. And there is, but it's, it's a little on the messy side. In other words, in order to come up with these results directly without going through all the intermediate steps, it turns out we do have a formula. Now the formula will calculate this for us directly. Once we have that number, we should be able to figure out these three. So in other words, we, if we want to know the simple compound and total interest, what we do is we calculate the future value. And then we can use that information to figure out what these three were. Okay. So that's the normal approach that we'll take. We don't have separate formulas for these, well, not for this one or this one. Instead, we'll calculate the future values and then we'll figure out what the simple compound and total interest must have been. All right. So hopefully now everyone sees where this is going. I mean, so now that we're allowing for compound interest because interest is paid more than once a year, we need to be able to calculate both the simple and the compound interest. Now, by the way, if you're wondering in practice, banks typically compound frequency every single day. So it gets a little messy, but that works in your favor because you're earning more compound interest. Now, unfortunately, though, so do the credit card companies. So you're actually paying compound interest when you borrow with your credit card. So it works both ways. It helps the investor or the saver. It's going to make things more expensive for the borrower. All right. So what is this mysterious formula that I've been alluding to? Well, here we go. Now, like I said, it looks a little terrifying. But don't you worry. We'll figure it out. So A is the future value, P is the principal that hasn't changed, R is the rate of interest, T is the time. The only thing that's new is that letter N, which represents the compounding frequency, which just simply means how many times a year is the interest paid to our account. Now I'll show you some techniques for simplifying this so that we can uh, do it without a lot of pain um, typing that directly the way it's written would be very difficult because you'll need a lot of parentheses. So I'm going to show you how to streamline it a little bit. But you know what? With a little practice, you'll get really good at this. And so what we're going to do is basically reproduce these results with the formula. Okay. Um, so in other words, I chose this example on purpose because we're, we're gonna see it again down here, except we're using the formula instead of the uh, you know, one step at a time approach. All right, so now, by the way, the compound and frequency, the, the ones you see uh, most frequently are quarterly, which means N is four, um, semi-annually means N is two, monthly means N is 12, and daily means N is 365. All right. Now, what we're gonna do is go back and revisit the same example. We have an investor putting, um, actually, yeah, $1,000, the same amount for in one year into a CD, the bank pays 4%, and we're gonna look at four cases in each case, the only thing that will change is the uh, compounding frequency. All right. 
So I've penciled in here, um, when we have annual compounding, N is one, semi-annual means twice a year or N equals two. Monthly is N equals 12. I didn't, we didn't have quarterly in here, but um, 12 and then daily is 365. So we're gonna do all four of these. And by the time we're done, we're gonna be pretty good at this. All right, so why don't we start with annually? Now we already know the answer is that we're gonna get $1,040, but let's use the formula to demonstrate it. All right, wow. Um, let me just clean this up a little bit. It's getting a little cluttered. So what you probably should do, this is my recommendation. Simplify it. Take this expression and reduce it to something simple. And here, that'll be very, very easy. And then do the same thing with the exponent. In other words, rewrite this as 1,000 times 1 1.04 to the first power. And then what, in this case, it, it doesn't really matter, but in the future cases, I'm gonna recommend that people do this part first in the parentheses and then multiply the result by the thousand dollars. If you try to go from left to right, you'll need a lot of parentheses and it's easy to get tripped up. So here we end up as we already knew with 1040 and we can break this down and because we know that the principal was a thousand dollars it must be the case that $40 is our total interest. But we also know that because of this I formula we had earlier, the simple interest is $40, which implies that all of this interest is simple interest. We did not earn any compound interest. So that will always happen when you keep the money in the bank for one year and the interest is paid annually. For any other scenario, there will be at least some compound interest. All right, so we can summarize this on the next page, which is showing that of the $40 worth of interest, all of it is simple. And again, that's because we have this formula here. Now, what happens when we jump up to semi-annual? And again, we've already seen this one. This is the $1,040.40. So we come through here. Now this time, let's do, let me just uh, erase this for now. Um, what I would like you to do is rewrite this as 1,000 times. Now here you've got one plus 0.04 over two. squared. And then furthermore, I think your best bet is to calculate this first. So go to your calculator and type 1.02 squared, and you should get 1.0404, and then multiply that by a thousand. So in other words, do 1.02 exponent. Actually, in this case, you can use the two. You can use the square button if you want to. What I'm showing you here will always work. All right, um, 1.02 exponent two equals times a thousand equals. And there's your result, 1,040. All right, did you all get that? So the strategy is simplify what's in the parentheses as much as possible, and then do that first and only at the end multiply by the thousand. Like I said, if you try to go from left to right, I think it'll get too messy. Unless you're already very, very good with your calculator and that's fantastic, but 
this probably is a little easier anyway. All right. You know, sometimes simpler is better. You know? <laughs> um, but all right. Now, how about the next case? In this case, we jumped ahead to monthly. Ooh, now monthly is getting a little messy because 0.04 over 12 is a third of a percent. You can round this if you want to 0.0033333. If you want to be exact, one possibility is to say 0.04 divided by three equals plus one equals raised to the 12th power equals times a thousand equals. So in other words, you're, what you're essentially doing is calculating the exact value of 0.04 over 12. And um, wow, or you can, it, it doesn't need, I'll tell you what, because you're rounding the number to dollars and cents anyway. This is quite sufficient. 0033333. You don't need to go berserk with this because you're, we're just going to round this anyway. The bank is not going to give you a fraction of a cent. They can't. All right. What would you do with it? You can't spend it. Um, <clears throat> so you can either do the exact amount the way I showed you, or else you can just type in 1.003333 raised to the 12th times a thousand, and you should get approximately 1040.74. Now, we already know from past practice that simple is 40. That means we now earn 74 cents worth of compound interest. And you notice it keeps growing as we keep increasing the compounding frequency. Even with month, with quarterly, remember, it was about 60.4 cents. So now it's up to 74 cents. All right. Wow. Ooh, man, our fingers are getting quite a workout today, aren't they? Well, what about daily? Now, this one, you may also want to round it a little. Um, because 4% over 365 is a very, very small number. Oh my God, now that's small. So I rounded it here in this example to 1.00010989. But if you want the exact value, that's your privilege. Um, 104 over 365. equals plus one equals raised to the 365th power equals times a thousand equals, and you'll end up with the same thing. 0.04, let's do it right now. 365 equals, Yeah, it's the same. Anyway, look at it. It's about $1,040. I left the extra eight in there. It wasn't really necessary. Um, just so you can see, um, but it, the bank would round it to 81 cents. Okay, so I think somewhere in here I put together, oh, if I didn't, I should have. Uh, I wanted to put together a little chart. Well, I might as well do it right now. I want you to see, I'm kind of surprised that it's not here, where you can see them all together in one place. So. Now, this is the one of the maddening things about um, Microsoft. They've got this wonderful table feature. And by default, look at what these idiots did. It's green. Who in their right mind wants a green table? 
I have to go out of my way to find the right table. And you can't do anything about it. You can't say, oh, let, let me change the default table here. All right, so let's see. Let me just put this together real fast. That should do it. Let me see what I can do about making it bigger. Now you're probably wondering now, oh my God, that looks awful. I can see all of that stuff behind it. Well, there's a way to work around that. Here's what you do. Um, let's see. Format shape, fill. Now look at this, the solid fill, the default they offer you is green. Again, what is it with green in these people? So by telling it to fill in white, oh, look at that. All the stuff behind is gone. Now, I don't think we want such tiny font here either. Let's try, um, God's 18. Let's try 24. No, that's pretty good. You can read that, I think. Just about fits. Just about. All right, so here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to put together a nice little chart. just so you can have all the results together in one convenient place. All right, so um, the simple interest in each case was 40, so that's easy. The principle was always a thousand. That was that never changes. In this case, I mean, it's always a thousand. The compound interest for annual is zero. Okay, um, the semi-annual is um, 40 cents. Uh oh, I'm gonna run out of space. There we go. Now for this one, it was uh, 60, ooh, um, 604, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And then for monthly, it was 74 cents. Actually, you know what? Um, yeah, it's okay. I'll leave it. We don't really need all those extra digits because the um, it will be rounded up anyway. Okay. Okay, and then for Yuli, it was 80.8 uh, .8 cents. I 
I think we just about made it. Oh my God, I can't believe I squeezed in everything. All right, so here's what we're trying to show. Here's the different frequencies, annual, semi, oops, what happened here? Semi-annual, twice a year, quarterly, four times a year, monthly and yearly. Simple is always 40. Consistent here. So um, in the beginning, we have no compound interest. So this is always 40. We went to 40 cents, 60.4, 74, 808. The total is just the sum of these two, which is continuously increasing. The principal is never going to change. So the future value, how much you'll end up in your bank account at the end of the year, is going up as we increase the compounding frequency. So that's really what this is trying to show us. The future value goes up because our interest goes up, but not the simple, only the compound. So as you keep increasing, you can see, oh yeah, this is going up and it's going to reach at this point, 80.8 cents. Now, realistically, you're not going to go past daily. No bank is ever going to offer you to calculate your interest every hour, for example, or every minute, although it theoretically could be done. Pretty much this is the standard in the United States. Compounding is typically done on a daily basis. And by the way, when you get a credit card, they'll, they'll send you in the mail the card with this thick legal contract. And somewhere buried in those 20 pages of tiny print, it will explain all of this to you. And almost certainly they're gonna tell you that they're compounding your interest on a daily basis too. Okay, so it is in there somewhere. They have to tell you by law. Okay, so um, anyway, so actually that was a fairly complicated topic we just have been looking at. I'm surprised we got through so much of it so fast. Um, but this is the insight I wanted you to gain. Now, by the way, if you notice, all of these examples are based on the assumption that we're keeping the money in the bank for only one year. What we want to consider next is what happens if we leave the money in the bank longer than one year. So what I wanted to do is just mention, I'm not gonna have time to do this right now, but as the length of time over which money is either borrowed or lent increases, the compound interest will grow at an increasing rate. What do I mean by that? Okay. Well, um, like I said, we don't have time to look at this right now because you know this is we're going to need to do some more calculations here. But um, let me just draw a little graph, get give you a sense of where this is going. If I were to take a fixed sum of money, let's say this is you know using the example we're seeing here. Every year that goes by, my simple interest will go up by another $40. But every year that goes by, now let's say for example, we have daily compounding. After one year, you earn 80.8 .8 cents worth of compound interest. The next year, your compound interest will be more than double that. It's gonna go up more quickly than the passage of time. It starts to grow, it builds on itself. And so while initially, if you notice, the uh, amount of compound interest is actually quite small compared to the simple interest. If you give it enough time, eventually what starts to happen is it starts to grow. Ooh, and what happens down the road, and this could take 10 or 15 years, the compound interest starts to grow so quickly that eventually most of your return is coming from compound interest. So um, in the short run, it doesn't matter that much to your uh, investments, but in the long run, if you're saving for your retirement, for example, most of the money you end up earning will come from compound interest eventually, okay? Because it grows very quickly. Um, it builds on itself. It starts out very slowly. It's kind of like the tortoise and the hare. Um, 
kind of thing where one of them is going very steadily and the other is suddenly going very quickly and catches up and passes the other one. So anyway, um, I just want to mention that now. We'll prove it with the formulas, but just not right now, okay? Because um, what we'll need to do then is just take this formula and reapply it with several different cases like we did here. And you'll see that the compound interest will grow very quickly over time. All right, so, um, all right, I'll tell you what. So we got a lot done here today. I guess we can knock it off. It's a rotten day. Why don't you go home early? Or you're already home. What am I talking about? Um, and uh, so don't forget though, that next week we'll keep going on with chapter eight. And then on Friday, uh, sorry, Thursday, um, we'll have the test on chapters five and six. So for now, we'll continue with this, but then um, on the next a week from today, we'll have the real thing in the classroom, hopefully. No, no. <laughs> we're not gonna have the test online, that's for sure. I, I can hardly believe that there's any more storms coming. So um, we'll be in the classroom going forward. And uh, also, like I said, if you wanna watch this video again, um, it's going to be stored in my account. Uh, because apparently Moodle doesn't really have the capability of storing large files like this. So you go to YouTube. I'm sure you know how this works. Um, you got to find my name though. So it's stored right here. So if you type in my name, um, you should go. Now, what I've done here is I've set it up. It has all the videos, of course, but then I've organized them into playlists. Now, this one isn't ready just yet because it's the first video i've done this semester for this class when it's when the recording is ready i will be posting it in a playlist and you can go through here and look for the one that uh is for our class okay so there's a bunch of them here um so look for the one that is uh meant for our class and then you'll see it there and you know if you never know what's going to happen i mean um like one semester i couldn't get down there because my car was not running or something. And so um, it's possible there will be more, but it's not likely. But if there are, they will go into this playlist. And then you can look at it whenever you feel like it. These are all public. Um, you know, when you make a YouTube video, it asks you if you want it to be public or private. And so I made them all public because like, it's math. <laughs> if somebody wants to look at these, that's fine. Why would I have a problem with that? So, um, all right, anyway, so I guess we'll stop right here. And then, um, and also, the, like I said, these slides that I've just created will be also put on Moodle along with your, the original one. So you can look at what we did here. And so it's kind of like you get to keep a permanent record of what I would have written on the whiteboard, which is kind of nice. All right, so I guess I'll just see you all in person, I hope, on uh, Monday, okay? So I hope this wasn't too weird today. I mean, it'd been a while since you probably had any online classes. So, but I mean, you know, we know the drill now. So, all right. <laughs> bye, see you later. All right, so goodbye everyone. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you, thank you. Day. You're welcome. Um, I also have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, I didn't know that it was gonna be on Zoom. So I kind of like, um. Uh, got on Zoom a little bit late. I was wondering if you took attendance or... No, you know why? Because uh, when the recording is finished, there'll be a list there that I can look at. So as long as you've logged in before I turned it off, you'll be listed there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? See you next class. Okay, see you then. Okay, bye. <laughs>